Hello and welcome to another Organizational Behavior Capsule Lecture. Today we need to talk about change. Uh, Lao Tzu said that if you do not change direction, you may end up where you're heading, which is very apropos, I think. The fact is that organizations need to continually renew themselves and go through change. And it might be said that uh, change is really the only constant in organizations today. The external environment has gotten more and more dynamic over the past 20 years. And in fact, there's been numerous books written, you know, pretty much since 1989 when the Berlin Wall fell, that said that since then, the dynamism of the external environment has gotten much larger and it makes it much harder for organizations to cope. And there was a, a study done several years ago that shows that the average organization has the same lifespan as an average human being. And if you look at the Fortune 500 from, or even the Fortune 100, the 100 largest corporations in the world, from 20 years ago and compare them with today, you're gonna to find very little overlap, except of course for the oil companies. And what, what that means is that the, the dynamic environment has gotten to the point where some organizations survive, some don't. Some get larger, some get smaller. The unpredictable and somewhat fickle marketplace requires a constant attention. The fact that change is the norm, not the exception. That if you're not changing, you're probably dead. Uh, for more than 40 years, the organization behavior perspective has been riveted on the idea of plan change, that we're going to decide we're going to go in another direction, we're going to change the organization structure to match that, and onward we go. But that's not the, probably the case and probably never has been. The fact is that most, or, most change, you know, is prompted by external events. Sometimes we can sit there and say, okay, the organization needs to shift. But if it's doing okay, most people don't want to do that. Because you got to remember that organizations are composites of people. They're collectivities of people. And people don't like to change. I mean, those, those New Year's resolutions you made about losing weight and quitting smoking, how are those holding up? That's what I probably thought, you know, is that, you know, we have the will to change, but perhaps not the will to complete the steps necessary to, you know, to make the change. So what we're looking at here is that uh, Chris Argyris says that valid information, free choice, and internal commitment are considered integral parts of any intervention activity. These three processes are called the primary intervention uh, effects. In fact, what organizations do is that when they are planning change, when they've decided for some reason or another that they need to change, this is the process that they're going to start following through. And what happens is that the organization then has to take measures, take steps to ensure that change happens. Uh, Edgar Schein talked about the organizational coping processes, such as the ability to take in and communicate information reliably and, and validly, internal flexibility and creativity to make changes which are demanded and the integration and commitment to the multiple goals of the organizations, an internal climate of support and freedom of, from threat. That is, it, when there's threat, people don't really you know, feel like you know, they, they want to change. They know they have to. An internal climate of support and freedom, and the ability to continuously redesign the organization structure to be congruent with tasks and goals. Basically, look at organizational capabilities here. Uh, the, from that organization behavior perspective, Organizational effectiveness is a process, not as been defined traditionally in terms of organizational outcomes. Uh, the idea there being that we're, we're really bad at measuring things such as organizational effectiveness, so we use proxies for it. Is the organization profitable is you know, one of the most easily uh, grasped ones. What's the return on investments? Are they growing? Are they stagnant? Do we fit in the GE9 cell grid? Do we fill in, in, you know, in the Boston Consulting Group 4 cell grid? These kinds of measures of effectiveness are fuzzy at best, shall we say. So the organization behavior perspective looks at how do we make change comfortable for the individuals in the organization. We're going to get back to that. But there's a segment of, of the field called organization development, OD. What, what this is, the full set of premises, assumptions, values, and strategies of the OB perspective put in, 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 into practice. It assumes that change is purposeful and dynamic is accomplished through application of behavioral science, because that's what we are, behavioral scientists, and is accomplished according to carefully prescribed ground rules. 
On the other hand, revolutionary and evolutionary change are generally not considered to be within the purview of OD. So what organization development is concerned with, deep, long-lasting, organization-wide change. So we're going to look at organization diagnosis, process consultation, team building, action research, job enlargement, job enrichment, conflict management, those things we've been talking about all semester long. OD can really be traced back to several events and movements in the 30s and 40s, the Hawthorne studies, sensitivity training, developments in survey research and feedback te techniques, and of course the socio-technical school of research and analysis. Sensitivity training, these are T groups. Uh, <laughs> I tend to avoid them myself, but some people find them beneficial. Uh, Kurt Levin uh, conducted a training workshop to help improve race relations, community leadership in New Britain, Connecticut in 1946. It was probably the first T group. But the T groups for a long time became the method by which organization members learned how to communicate honestly, directly about facts and feelings. Developed warm, fuzzy feelings towards each other. You know, these things are known for their group hugs. You can tell I'm a bit cynical about them. And the reason I'm cynical is because they do work. Uh, T groups, transaction groups of any sort actually do work for about a week. And then people get back into the game playing the, the, the ill feelings, you know, all the stuff that makes up organizational life. So I'm not a real big fan of them. Uh, which leads us to action research. Uh, Thompson, Organization in Action, I think it was uh, mid-70s, mid-late 60s, 67, talked about collecting organizational diagnostic type data. We're going to find in, find out what's wrong with your organization. We're going to systematically feed that back to groups of people who provided the input. We're going to use that to discuss what that, in, what that information means to these members. And then we're going to jointly develop action implementation plans. And we're going to use the feedback from those to follow up and see where it's going. It's, it's a combination research consulting gig kind of thing. And there's, there still are a lot of practitioners of this in, in the OD field. In fact, they're probably you know, a fairly large contingent nowadays. And it makes some sense because you're doing little interventions, seeing how they turn out, and then continuing on and making more. But we know that there's resistance to change. Koch and French basically said that group participation well, in, in planning change tends to reduce people's resistance to it, which is a very good thing. Uh, Levin goes on to describe social organizations resting in a state of qu stable quasi-stationary equilibrium. Uh, we, you know, we've talked about equilibrium in other contexts, most you know, specifically Nash equilibria. And that's what this is, you know, that any organization, any collectivity of individuals, uh, in any complex system will be at rest. I mean, very simple, Newtonian kind of idea that an object at rest will remain at rest until we apply appropriate force or sufficient force. To affect social change, Levin says, one must begin with analysis of conditions for no change that is the state of the equilibrium. And he calls his field or his, his uh, method, if you will, force field analysis, and it has a lot of currency. There are two basic approaches for accomplishing adding forces in the desired direction or diminishing opposing forces. What Levin says we need to do is to unfreeze the organization from its stable state, make the changes, and then refreeze back in the new state. And then, of course, you know, we, we fall away from this sometimes. Uh, the OB, the OD, the OT perspectives on change sometimes fall into geez, what do we do? And that's where Peter Senji comes in. Uh, Senji's uh, seminal book, uh, The Fifth Discipline. For Senji, change is learning, and learning is change for people and organizations. And he developed these ideas of five disciplines, systems thinking, personal mastery, mental model, shared vision, and team learning. And these five, he says, make up you know, the, the, the five disciplines. And the, sixth, or the fifth discipline itself is this idea of systems level thinking. Systems thinking means that we're going to diagnose the organization as a whole. Most of science is based on the idea of logical reductionism, that we're going, to, we're going to take the problem, we're going to break it up into small parts. The problem with this is that cutting an elephant in half doesn't give you two small elephants. It gives you a big elephant mess. So what we find out in a lot of 
a lot of change initiatives and a lot of interventions in anything, any complex system. Is that what we do over here affects things over here as well? And we're not real good at figuring that part out. We go ahead and do this and don't really think about what's going to happen you know, further off in the organization. But as complex systems, you know, it's, it's the whole idea behind complexity theory. The wings of a butterfly in Borneo affect the weather in, you know, in Europe, that kind of thing. And in complex organizations, we need to be able to get some idea to be able to predict those, and that's where systems thinking comes in. Uh, learning that enhances our capacity to create is what Senji says. Basically, though, every topic that we talk about in OB uh, is, is useful in organizational change. We're going to have to figure out motivation, reward systems, leadership, uh, creating new organization structures and systems, changing the culture of the organization, if you will. Change brings it all together. It is where the rubber meets the road for organization behavior. But, and there's always a but to this kind of thing, isn't there? The caveats with organizational change are huge. Uh, research does show you that most organization change efforts fail. In fact, you know, depending upon the intervention, as many as two-thirds of them fail. Why? Well, because organizations are made up of human beings. And the fact is they do, like Newtonian physics, develop a huge amount of inertia. You've got you know, a million people working for a company like Walmart, it's hard to move a million people in a direction. Some of them are, are going to want to follow some art, some are going to resist. This is why, well, and a lot of change efforts aren't effectively thought through, that we're going to do this in this part of the organization, but not over in this part. And frankly, that doesn't work. You've got to change the organization as a whole. But it can be described, you know, as trying you know, to repair the engines on an aircraft at 35,000 feet flying at 500 knots. We've got a problem here, Houston. So it's not surprising a lot of organization change efforts fail and makes people very leery of doing so. In fact, a friend of mine down at University of Queensland, Ray Zamuto, uh, presented a study to us once upon a time. His research showed that change efforts in organizations actually served to reinforce the existing organizational ideology. Well, what the hell does that mean? Well, basically, what Ray was saying is that when you make changes to organizations, rather than actually changing the culture of the organization, you tend to reinforce what's already there. You know, they're, they're, they're the existing belief system. And... Outside of cutting into people's consulting income, that's a pretty big shock into you know, the folks who are you know, into this idea of being organizational consultants and change agents. Our problem is change is tough. It's hard. It's exhausting. My God, at times it is painful. I have gone to organizations as a change agent, and it's painful to do so. The problem is... No matter how painful, no matter how difficult, no matter what the failure rate is, organizations that are incapable of change are dinosaurs. That little bitty walnut brain in the back of their head is saying, well, we kind of need the change, but we can't. And if you can't, you're dead. So, you know, we have no good alternatives here. You change or you die. On that happy note, I'm Dwight Lemke. Have a good day.